You are listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast brought to you by Birmingham Live. Hello and welcome back to the Claret and Blue podcast. My name is Dan Ronson, joined for the first time in 2021, I believe, by Matt Kendrick. Matt, are you well? Yeah, I refuse to say Happy New Year. I can't say Happy New Year to your 15 days in. It's too late. Yeah, it's too late. I've been after about a week. No, after about two days, really. Yeah, it's, that's gone now. Christmas gone all over with. We, we're back in the back in the stride uh, stride of things, back with a live podcast. So for those of you watching live on Facebook today, we, can, we want you to get involved in the comments. We're going to do a Q&A, some are transfer related, some of our usual current blue nonsense, as always. For long time watchers of the podcast, do you remember when we used to take questions from social media? In, this is in the office. We used to do our little segments about the match and there'd be you, me and Ash or you, me and James. And then we'd do random Twitter questions in the mug of destiny. Do you remember doing that? In the office in person? I can't even remember the office, to be honest. <laughs> um, hey, actually, Mike from the office came to see me the other day because he got really? to pick up, some, pick up some kits. So I've actually seen, a, a, from a socially distance, I've actually seen of one of our colleagues face-to-face. So wow. that's so, so, so 2019, isn't it, that? I know, I know yeah. <laughs> Who's interested in that? Um, also, for people who have not been watching the podcast that long, we've done this format with Stan Petrov more recently where we have a selection of questions, but we do them at random to keep it a bit more what, entertaining, is it, I guess, to, instead of going in order with it's just random, so a random selection. So I'm going to ask the questions, obviously to you, Matt, and obviously they're for, for me as well, so I, I know what's in there, but I don't, I've don't. i still going to offer my opinion. But we want the people who are watching live on Facebook to share your answers in the comments and we'll flash them up on screen and we'll have a little bit of a debate. As I said, some are more serious than the others. Enough ramble. Do you want me to go for the first one? Yeah, go on. What we got? I, I like being in control of the mug. It's a, it's a different change of pace for me. Uh, it's a great question to start with. Okay, so this is assuming Man City activate Douglas Louise's buyback clause. At the end of the season, you can only sign one. Douglas Louise or Ross Barkley? Ooh. That's a difficult question. So basically, forget the, the buyback bit. If you're going to lose one, Douglas Louise or Ross Barkley, who are you more interested in keeping? a good question probably Douglas Louise you know yeah I agree Barkley's a great player but Douglas Louise is so important I think Barkley's become important as well to the extent that he's just kind of stopped it being the um, I suppose Watkins could could claim credit as well stopped it being the Jack Greeley show hasn't he in terms of what Villa can do going forwards but um, Douglas it's funny because Douglas Louise it feels like we've kind of been been the making of him, um, mm. and it feels like he kind of properly is kind of one of our own and and, and Villa now. Uh, and I know he is. I know he's a permanent signing. But with this clause thing hanging over me, it's always it's always been this kind of perception that is he is he on loan in a kind of way. Yeah. Uh, whereas Ross Barkley, probably because you've had to cope without him for a couple of weeks anyway. Um, you know the kind of the longest. You know he's he's one of these ones. He's always forty eight hours away from being recovered, isn't he? Um, for the last month, um, yeah, I'd say Douglas Louise just because I think he's kind of um, he's established. I think Ross Barkley yeah. is still not an established Aston Villa player because you know how many games like like six or seven or something. Yeah, exactly, exactly that. Um, why do why why can't we have both? <laughs> Well, We've got billionaire owners. Danny Barker says, what a sick first question. I don't know whether that's sick as in like the kids. Like, it's a sick, it's a good one, or whether it's sick as in twisted and delusional. Uh, either way, it's a good first question. Mark Hudson says, keep Louise. But Brian O. Madahin, <laughs> terrible pronunciation, says more chance of Barkley. I think there's more chance of Louise because Louise is currently out proper player he isn't on loan is he we, we do actually own him obviously there's the buyback clause thing but Ross Barkley is still a Chelsea player at the end of the day my it's thinking of it question, is you know it's that question it's like when my kids are kind of playing up and they're saying kind of dad which one's your favourite and all that kind of stuff and <laughs> do you the, the you option is either them? both or none you know <laughs> yeah. you can't <laughs> you can't pick you can't pick between although I'll just have yeah Douglas Louise you can choose one Premier League player to join the 2021 <laughs> Villa squad who are you going for? Give me yours first, because I think I'm, I think mine's going to be rather random, and people are going to roll their eyes and think, "Matt, what are you going on about?" Okay, well, that's not like you to make people roll their eyes. Um, <laughs> mine's a more serious answer, and I was thinking, what position do we need? Because you could say De Bruyne or somebody like one of the top, top, top players. And I have still picked a top player, but I thought I was thinking of position as well. So I've gone with Mohamed Salah to replace his Egyptian teammate Trezeguet at right wing. I feel sorry for Trezeguet because he's a great player. <laughs> he's a great Egyptian. But Mo Salah, obviously a, a top, top player. 
fix the problem right wing position for Villa and score a hatful of goals. Oh, this isn't realistic, by the way. Someone's just put Tammy Abraham in the comments, which that's a more realistic answer. This is just totally random hypothetical. Um, so yeah, I'd put Mo Salah on the right wing for Villa. What's yours? Mine's random. He could probably replace Barkley, actually, although he's not, not nowhere near like for like. And this is not going to make Villa kick on any higher than they are. And this is purely to indulge me. Um, <laughs> I like the lad at Wolves, Podence, just because oh, he's yeah. so kind of... I like players who you kind of pay, you know, the, the phrase, you know, they're kind of worth the admission fee alone. I don't know whether, I don't know whether you make Villa a better better team. I don't know how you'd fit him in the team, but he's just, he's like the kind of Portuguese Barry Bannon. He's just, whether it's because he's just like this diminutive little... Uh, Isn't he a striker? Sort of, or a winger? Isn't he a striker or a winger? A number 10 kind of attacking midfielder. Uh, but he's just, some of, I've probably, I'm probably judging this. Uh, he's probably very pad, he's probably very... 2016 Villa Transfer Committee way of looking at players, but I'm ba- basing it on a kind of like a 30 second show reel. I think just because yeah. some of his uh, some of his skills, some and, and I think because he's got that low centre of gravity, I just like him. I think he's easy on the eye, and I think he's um, I think he's probably what we wanted Carlos Hill to be. To be honest, when yeah. when he signed, uh, I don't know how you'd fit him in. I don't think he'd improve Aston Villa's team whatsoever. I just think he'd look quite pretty on the ball, and it would make me. Uh, just a couple of kind of you know three sixty spins and nutmegs. Would, that, that's all I want, mate. I'm 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 I'm, <laughs> I'm a low maintenance kind of man. A couple of the comments. Darren Williamson's gone similar to me. He's gone Raheem Sterling to to fix a winger problem. Gareth Edwards says Trippier, and then I was thinking Trippier's not a Premier League player anymore. And then he said, "Oh, sorry, I meant Tierney, the left back from Arsenal." <laughs> um, which again, thinking more the positions we need. I did think Andy Robertson was going to be my option to go left back, and but then I was like, "Oh, that's a bit harsh on target." Obviously, Robertson's a massive upgrade on target, but I was like, "Sort the winger out, and then defence is uh, we'll sort that later." Best game you've ever attended. Let you go first. Be a Villa game. <laughs> yes, of course. I think it would be. It would have happened early in 1994. Whether it's the semi-final against Tranmere, or sorry, the oh, second no. second leg. I did go to the first leg away at Tranmere as well, but the second leg against Tranmere when it was just a remarkable Sunday afternoon. You know where Villa kind of plucked plucked a Wembley appearance from the jaws of despair. Uh, and still went about it the hard way and had to do it on penalties and drama. Bosnich perhaps should have got sent off, didn't get sent off, stayed on to become the penalty shootout here. It's either that or it's the final. I'd probably say it was the final. Um, went with me, my best mate, me, me dad, um, best mate's uncle. Um, and it was just Villa won something. You know, and it was just that that kind of lulled into a full sense of security that Villa regularly win, won things. Uh, you know, Man, all the hype was surrounding Man United. Um, Villa did a job on them that day. Ron Atkinson kind of, um, you know, did a, a tactical job um, on Sir Alex Ferguson that day. Graham Fenton appeared from nowhere in that team. Dalian Atkinson's opening goal off his shin took so long to get into the net uh, I was standing by that goal um, so I think it'd be that I think it, Villa, Villa, Villa winning at Wembley for the first time and creating an illusion in a young man's mind that this was the way it was destined to be forevermore uh, what about you? Oh, I'm also going to go for a cliche answer not that yours was but winning at Wembley and go for the playoff final I almost went for the semi-final against Liverpool for Wembley just because of that was not unexpected but obviously we weren't as good back then as we were for the playoff, playoff final um, but yeah like it, it would have been nice to have just gone oh this random game like some coming in someone says 6-2 against Everton about 40 years ago I mean that's it before even your time um, it, so it wasn't it wasn't 40 years ago it was during my time it's probably oh was it really probably, yeah 1988 89 I think that would have been um, I mean that's not oh yeah 30 30 odd um but yeah, winning at Wembley, the playoff final, what it meant for, for the club as well, the way that we did it, the, that McGinn goal, the celebrations after, like everything about that game was 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 next level. Um, some of the comments, Anthony says, rather than away two seasons ago, a lot of people talk about that as being like a, a defining moment. Matt Collins says the West Brom semi-final, that playoff run. Um, Michael Gillespie, 1996 League Cup final. Um, two shouts for the West Brom semi-final actually and then Pete Powell AVSC 5 Birmingham 1 that also did cross my mind um, and Andrew Daniels says exactly the same um, good selection of games there isn't there I was, it was difficult I did want to go with something a bit more random but winning at Wembley and getting promoted back to the Premier League was like yeah that's the, that's the pinnacle of recent years 
Yeah, I'd stick um, the, the, the beating Derby in the playoff final would be up there as well from a kind of a dad's point of view because that was the one that I took my lad to and that, mm. that was special. I suppose, I mean, I've been lucky enough to be in the press box for some interesting ones as well, you know, seeing Villa win away at Old Trafford um, with Gabby scoring the winner and the Blackburn six, the Villa six, Blackburn four at Villa Park. Um, yeah. So... It, it's nice that we've got so many choices. Even even in what what until the last six months has, has been, you know, universally accepted as a bleak period, probably in Villa's history. A decade. Still got kind of um lots of lots of key games, lots of interesting, exciting goal laden games to, to pick from. Um depends what, what makes a what makes a great game. Is it, well, yeah. is it is it the the importance? You know, is it having something tangible to show for it at the end of it, a trophy or Premier League status? Is it just because it was the first time you saw saw your mates? You know, for three years and you in the away end and had a great great laugh or whatever. Um, but yeah, next question. Loads of comments coming through by the way. Dean Saunders home debut four two Liverpool yeah. two one Wembley three two Leeds two thousand cup quarter final. The Holt's last stand was a great one when we beat yeah. Liverpool um, with Dwight scoring twice down the Holt end. Um, God, there's loads. I feel like this is going to be a quick fire question. I don't really know why I've included it, but I probably felt at this point when I was writing them down that we didn't have enough football questions. So this is asked earlier on Twitter. What happens to Ali Samato when his loan deal ends? <laughs> He comes back to Villa and they try and sell him. I guess <laughs> probably gets probably gets waved farewell with a one sentence statement on the Villa website. I'd have thought uh, as you as usually happens. I don't know what then. Oh, Daniel, why is it? Why expose me ignorance? Why don't you you know give me a heads up on some of the questions? Why don't you give me a heads up on the ones that would make <laughs> us look like we're informed? I don't, I don't know where know. he is. I knew he'd gone out on loan. He comes back at the end of the season and I'd assume we'll try and sell him and that's as far as Ali Samata's story goes. I liked when, I think I probably included it because at the position Villa were at at the time, it felt like it made sense. To, obviously, we needed another striker. He came in, we had all the Tanzania stuff. Everyone was like, oh, this guy's like the, the face of a nation or whatever, like he's representing them in the Premier League, the first Tanzanian player in the Premier League. It's, like, oh, it's nice that it's associated with Villa. He looked okay to begin with. He scored that goal at Wembley. The header against Bournemouth, I think it was, and it was like, yeah, okay player, but for where Villa want to be, he's never going to be enough to 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 um, be in the squad, even probably. I don't think, especially because Villa have took, taken such a step up from last year to this, that he's never going to be around it anyway. So he'll come back and be sold, and that's the end of that, I think. According to some hasty googling, he's got three years left on his contract in the summer. Um, wow. Signed a four and a half year deal last last January. That seems um, ill advised, doesn't it? <laughs> The, the, the biggest, the biggest, kind of the most damning statement about Ali Samata is that that Villa would rather have got him off the wage bill on loan at the moment, or, or some of his wages off the wage bill on loan, and left themselves ridiculously light with the yeah. centre forward options. That that's that to me says more than anything about Aston Villa's future plans for for Ali Samata. I thought I thought he was okay in the kind of desperate kind of needs must sign him with with. Wesley's injury taking Villa by surprise last January, but Villa are an upgrade on with everything that they're doing from a year mm -hmm. ago. So if Ali Samata was only just about good enough to fill a fill a gap back then, he, he's not going to be good enough for for the Villa squad going forward. Agreed, and the comments echo those thoughts as well. Uh, as soon as I started reading that question out, someone put "sell him," and that was it. And so yeah, fair enough. Um, <laughs> Ah, uh, here we go. Back to some nonsense. So this when I said that, this is weird, right? Because I'm writing them down, thinking, "Oh, we need more football questions." So I include a football question that no one really cares about. Because then I, I also write silly things like this. Because I've just seen it on Twitter and it made me laugh. So someone asked, <laughs> spent the time to send me a tweet saying, "Matt, what's your favourite chocolate bar?" I discovered a Star Bar recently, and they've changed my life. Um, Toblerone. Oh, Next question. No. No, no, because, no. Because the sheer scale of it, when you got when you got when you got gifted a Toblerone, all the under the Christmas tree or because somebody had been somewhere exotic like Belgium <laughs> or whatever for <laughs> Switzerland for the holidays. Um, and, and the reason I say that is because I asked my wife to get me one for Christmas and she never got me one, so I'm still sulking about it. But no, still bitter about it. It's, it's, mate, that's harder than Douglas Louise versus Barkley, isn't it? You know, probably... <sighs> Galaxy know Caron, what, is the right answer, by the way. You know what I will complain about? Cabri have tried to be a bit too... Um, Try to to add too much to a recipe that's already a winning formula. To me, 
fruit, you know, not fruit, not whole nut, a big oh. slab of whole nut, is what you want. But they started putting like gingerbread in it and all these kind of things and banana in it. You're thinking, well, it's no need. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Next question. When will we beat Manchester United again? <laughs> Next time we play them. Never, probably. It always goes wrong though, doesn't it? It's always something. They always do something to, to get the points. Cheat. <laughs> Uh, this was the, was this the last time I was on? That was the last time I was on a podcast, wasn't it? I was moaning about um, oh, yeah. Ogba and Fernandez and VAR and Stockley Park and stuff like that. So the thing is now, I said this on the when we did the post match podcast from that defeat was it felt even harder to take than ever because I feel that we're closer to them than mm. for a long time. And the fact that they're sitting top of the Premier League at the moment and we're saying that we feel closer to Manchester United in terms of you know competitiveness. Bring it on. I mean, when when do we play back at Villa Park? Oh, Christ knows. We're probably going to play 47 matches in could be any time, yeah. days, aren't we? Um, I think we could beat them, beat them back at Villa Park. I, I know what we're saying. It's been it's been so long. Um, and how many times we've beaten them? Is it just that Gabby game? I think so, yeah. Um, in, God, how many years? 2006? 2009, was it that? The Gabby five, sorry. Um yeah, I think we beat them three times in the Premier League year or something in that first year, or the, the the you'll never win anything with kids, the Gabby one, and then ninety six or whatever it was. I think that's the only times we've ever beat them in the Premier League. And considering up until twenty fifteen, we played them twice a season for twenty odd years. That's ridiculous, isn't it? Yeah, but wouldn't it be sweet if we do beat them when they've actually got something on it this season? Well, like we deny them winning the title or something. Yeah, well, I'm just looking down the fixture list to see we're due to play them on the eighth of May. So oh, they'll probably win the league. Right. The park. <laughs> the title challenge until then. That'd be that'd be sweet, wouldn't it? I mean, they won't be in a title challenge. Is my synopsis, but there we go. We might be. Well, yeah, that's good. It might be a title decider. <laughs> uh, next question: Which position do you think we need to strengthen in the January transfer window? Centre forward, in terms of getting getting another option in there, um, getting a, an option who is superior to, to Ali Samata. Um, and Borja yeah, Baston. Say again. And Borja Baston, yeah. yeah. What's, what's Borja doing there? You know, God forbid anything happens to Ollie Watkins, and we know he's not for the because of goalposts and, and VAR decisions and, and crossbars and stuff. He's not, not been as prolific in the last perhaps month or four, five or six weeks as we'd like. But if anything happens to him, it, it leaves Villa massively light. Um, mm. You know, I've seen Ash has done a couple of stories about these. Club sniffing around Keenan Davis in the championship to give him some loan experience, which I think would be great for him, but we just can't afford to send him out out on loan yeah. at the moment. So uh, it'd be a centre forward for me. I'll, I'll let you decide who the centre forward is, Dan. Well, a lot of people in the comments, or I say a lot of people, one person and the comments from earlier said Tammy Abraham. Now, I don't know whether it'll be a Tammy. Oh, here's another one from Colin. I don't know whether it'll be somebody like Tammy, because that feels like somebody who's going to come in and want to, if he's leaving Chelsea, he's going to want to come in. They have to buy him as well, obviously, with Barker being on loan. I don't see Villa doing a move of that size in January. I also don't see him coming in and thinking, well, I'm leaving Chelsea to play games. I'm not going to sit behind Ollie Watkins. I don't think you'll move Ollie Watkins out on the right-hand side and play Tammy up front and Watkins on the right. It's an option, but Watkins has been brought in as the centre-forward and has been, up until recently, was scoring goals, playing that position. So I don't see Villa making a big statement signing like a Tammy Abraham, in, especially in January in the window in the summer when Villa finished in top six or whatever maybe then it'll be a backup signing like you said that's better than Samata better than Davis but not as good as Ollie Watkins who that is and how much you have to spend to get that I'm not sure so 12 to 15 million on a backup striker is probably what they'll do yeah it's a difficult or one to... somebody that can play striker and wide yeah I don't think Dean Smith's all of a sudden going to start playing um, two up top because that yeah. makes it even more de- you know it's been hard enough from it initially to fit Barkley and um, and Grealish into the same team. Um, so you're right; it's somebody who's going to come in and you know effectively have to accept playing second fiddle, but being good enough to replace Watkins. You know, if he's injured or suspended, I don't know whether you know this is this is um, a job for Villa's scouting team, but I don't know what I don't think that player exists. In the Premier, you know, I'm not sure you get a Premier, like you say, a Premier League reserve come yeah. and do that. Uh, it's weird, isn't it? That it's kind of like analogy time. It's kind of like um, on your wedding day, just kind of 
you know, getting your mistress lined up as well, who's not 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 as not as good looking, but he's you know he's more understanding, prepared prepared to play second fiddle, and only see you kind of once a month. Um, so good luck to Joanne Lange and um, <laughs> interesting you know, lifestyle you've got there. <laughs> getting that one, uh, getting that one over the line. Uh, Chris Heath says a winger who can play striker. Colin mentions the guy from Celtic, who is Eduard, I assume. Again, if you're spending forty odd million from from Eduard, he's not going to come in and sit on the bench it just doesn't make sense Mark Hudson says did Tyree last time we did one of these but not for the 20 million that our Liverpool Echo colleague mentioned and again just don't see a big-ish move like that happening it'll be maybe somebody who's in the championship at the moment Josh King is, is the one doing the rounds again isn't he but then you think well, he's not really doing it in the championship so what's the point of him coming in and being a backup to a top 8 Premier League side or top 10 Louis Barry <laughs> yeah, why not? Perfectly pulled out for the next one. Is Keenan Davis Premier League quality? Um, <laughs> he's been with, I say he's been with the Premier League club. Villa haven't been a Premier League club for three of the years that he's been been with the club. But so you know, successive managers see enough in him to keep him around the squad. Um, you Is know, that because there's no one else though. Yeah, potentially, but you know, I don't. Keenan Davis wouldn't be at a Premier League club and be in the Premier League squad, be in the Premier League squad every week uh, or most weeks if he wasn't Premier League quality. What level of the Premier League and what job you're asking him to do is a is a different matter. Um, That's a good point. I don't think I don't think he's he's ever going to be a twenty goal a season striker. I don't think he's probably ever going to be a 10, 10 goal a season striker in in the Premier well, that's League. His game is it though? I kind of struggle to score goals with, isn't it? Yeah, I think he'd be better playing in a two. His hold up play and what he can do with the ball is very good. I've seen Jack Grealish talking about him and how strong he is and how good he is on the ball. But if you're playing in a one striker system and you're relying to score goals and where Villa are at the moment, he's not good enough for where Villa want to be. Much like Samato and other players that we've talked about, he, he's not going to feature playing for Villa when they're aiming for the top eight, top six of the Premier League or better or going for cup competitions. Is he Premier League quality and that could he do a job for a Sheffield United or West Brom down in the bottom three and trying to be trying to survive in the Premier League? Yeah, maybe. But we don't know because he's not played enough games regularly enough to see what he can do. He needs a spell in the Championship first before deciding if he's Premier League quality. Yeah, I think if, Premier, if, if Ken Davis... I mean, listen, Ken Davis, the player today, is a million miles from the player that Villa signed. I think he's, he's made yeah. massive improvements to his game. But I think if Keenan Davis wants to look back at his career in 10 years' time and say, what have I, how, how many goal, goals were scored, how many games were played, what have I achieved? I think he's going to have to do it in the Championship um, to do that. He might think, you know, I don't, don't profess to know Keenan Davis, but he might think, actually, I'm going to eke out as much of this time as a Premier League club on mm. Premier League wages as I can and look back on my career and think, you know, I made made a good living out of out of football, um, but I think you know, I would have thought, how old is he, Dan? Is he about twenty three now? I think. I think he's twenty three. Early February, we said if, after the the Villa kids game, because we were saying Louis Barry at seventeen. I guess it was the Liverpool kids, blah blah blah. blah. But he, I, I said, and I didn't want to use Lou Barry's positivity to be negative about Keenan Davis, but I would say that Keenan Davis wouldn't have run through the Liverpool half and put that ball away in the same way that Lou Barry did, because it's, it's a different kind of strike that, that Davis is. But you still think a professional footballer should be able to find the back of the net when they've got all that time. However, the point is, Lou Barry at 17 looks more potentially developed as a finisher than Davis is at 22-23. Davis at 22-23 isn't getting a sniff around the Premier League side, whereas Lou Barry at 22-23 should be starting games for a Premier League side if his development continues in the same way that it looks like it could, if he fulfils his potential. I'd rather Lou Barry be in and around the squad for the next couple of years than Keenan Davis getting to 23-24-25. Davis is contracted until the summer of 2024, apparently again according to a quick Google. and I'd be amazed from his point of view and Villa's point of view if he's still an Aston Villa player by then if I'm yeah, being honest I think if he's still an Aston Villa player from the club's point of view it means that they haven't sufficiently upgraded at the rate that, that we kind of all want them to do and I think yeah. you know, or or the flip side is that he's, he's come on leaps and bounds and <laughs> started banging in 10 goals a season but I just think I think I think at the moment it suits both because yeah. you know he can still stick 
Premier League player on his passport. You know, he's, he's going to be earning fantastically well. He's going to be developing and learning again alongside a really good calibre of players. And Villa, who haven't quite sussed how they get that kind of mistress, that centre-forward mistress through the door, have somebody who who's keen and willing and, and, and developing as they go along. So I think it, suit, it probably suits Villa until this summer and then have a fresh look at it then and, and, and see what the future holds for him. Another hypothetical question. Would you swap Concer and Watkins for Twan Zabi and Tammy Abraham? That's a great question, I think. Go on. No, why, why, would you, why would you want to swap them? Are they not both doing their jobs fantastically well at the moment? Exactly, but there's this kind of romanticism, isn't there, about loan players? I look at that and go, well, Twan Zabi and Abraham were on loan. They did well. They did a job. Frash and Villa, now they've gone. Aren't really featuring for Man United and Chelsea. They're bigger clubs weren't interested in coming back to Villa. However, Conser and Watkins, like you said, they're doing their job. I don't think I'd... I think Conser's better than Twan Zabi anyway. And I'd, I think Watkins could be go on, could go on to be better than Abraham anyway in the Premier League. So I don't know why you'd want to swap them, but I like it as a question because it's a, you know, past versus present kind of thing. I wouldn't swap... I wouldn't swap either of them. And I think there's a kind of certain kind of charm about the fact that that Villa have, have say, they've hardly plucked them both from obscurity, have they? They've both been been playing for a, a really, really good, strong, competitive... Um, Brentford and Brentford. <laughs> ...championship team. Um, but I like the fact that, that Villa have, have backed their scouting enough to think that these, these two players, you know, can do it at a high level. And they've been, you know, we're only only six months in with Watkins, and we're only eighteen months in with with Esri Conte, but they've been vindicated in, in those decisions. You know, they still yeah. have to pay decent, you know, really good good money for them. Uh, but I'd, I'd stick with the two we've got definitely. Yeah, Chris, he said uh, Conte still hasn't been drawn past, and Watkins' work weight work work weight Watkins' work rate links the team perfectly. And Sam Redden says, "Isn't Conte one of the top defenders?" Oh God, I'd love to be able to talk. Isn't Conte one of the top defenders in the Premier League stats-wise? Which, yeah, I think that's correct. Um, Gareth says, no, but I would try and buy Axel above Hawes slash Engels any day. Do you have any sympathy for Conor Harahan? To a point, you know, he earns more in a in a week than I do in a year, um, <laughs> I should think. Um, so, to a point, I think Conor Harahan, when he hands, hangs up his boots, I don't know, what, what is, is he about 30, is he in about five or six or seven years' time? He can be really, really proud of the, the journey that he's gone from. You know, he's played in all the divisions. Um, I don't think he's looked out of place in the Premier League. Uh, I don't think he's a, he's a good enough all rounder to truly impose himself on the Premier League. Uh, and again, like, like we said with Keenan and Davis, there comes a point where if Villa are going in a certain direction that you know there has to be a bit of bit of collateral damage, if you like. There has to be a few people who are left behind. Uh, mm. I think I think I think Connor's going to be be one of those. Um, do I have sympathy for him? No, because I think I think he's done what 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 Villa asked him to do. You know, of that flurry that Steve Bruce made twenty seventeen, that was seventeen four years ago. Bloody hell! Yeah. Of those of that flurry of signings that he he made, um, you know, is he the only one still there? There's, there's Neil Taylor still there, and there's Lansbury. There's Lansbury still there. Yeah. Um, anybody else? I've, I've I've lost track of who else there there was. Um, James Bree, Bjarne, Hogan. Um, so he's done. He's done what Villa, what Villa expected of him, and more. To be fair, um, yeah. You know, he's got assists and goals in the in the Premier League as well. Um, so I don't really have sympathy for him because I think he will have known this. He will have been. You know, he, he, I think he'd love to be a, a regular starter each week. But by doing what he's done with Villa, has enabled him the platform to either get a lesser Premier League club move now. Or to move to the top end of the championship, which either of those things will be an upgrade on what he was doing at Barnsley. So, I think with with, with Conor Harahan, it's kind of you know let's be grateful for for, for what he's given us. Um, but if he, if as it looks like he is going to be kind of on his way soon, good luck to him. I think he'll do. I think he's a he's a he's a consummate professional. I think he'll do a great job with wherever he goes next. Come and say he always gives a hundred percent. But Villa have moved up a level now, and he falls behind talent like Ramsey. Um, Colin says yes. Feel sorry for him uh, or feel sympathy. Great at set play, free kicks. Uh, Mark says also says yes. Would do a good job elsewhere. Daniel says a class championship player, not good enough for the Premier League. I don't think the team has outgrown him, and I think that's probably the, the point we kind of have around. Much like the Keenan Davis story. Is he good enough to be a Premier League player? I think yes. 
in that bottom six to eight somewhere. I, I think I think you could start every week for a, a team down down in that um, period of the table. For Villa, if they're pushing towards the top eight of the Premier League. Obviously, he's not good enough to, to feature because he isn't at the moment. And even from the bench, uh, however old um, Ramsey is, is he 19 maybe? He comes on ahead of him these days. So that would suggest that Harahan is probably going to be look, looking to, to move up, move on elsewhere. And Ramsey is, is going to be blooded in as that replacement player. So I don't feel sorry for him because like you kind of said at the start, even tongue-in-cheek, he's a footballer and this is his job and this is just part and parcel of it. That he came with, he came with us as a step up, used Villa, got promoted. Has a great time, earns good money, will go on elsewhere, have a, have a have a successful career, can hang his boots up and be proud. But also a little bit like, I do like him, do feel a bit sorry for him, but not to an extent where I'm like, oh, poor Con Harahan. I think I told you about this one earlier, so hopefully you've thought about an answer. The player that everyone else disliked, but you did like. Have you got a name? Yeah, I have, but I'm going to uh, I'm gonna tweak the question slightly and I've changed got it on. to manager. Oh, <laughs> go on, Is man. that all right or not? Yeah, go on. I'll, I'll do a player instead. Go on. Well, I thought, who does Facebook comments can do both. Facebook comments can do both. A player that you rated. Like Alan Hutton's an obvious one. People loved him. Some people hated him. But you go for manager. Well, people universally despised Alex McLeish, didn't they? Because of the Dower football and because of the um, the Birmingham City connection. But I don't know. It's you know People have heard me waffle on about managers and, and falling out in managers along the way. So I'm probably, probably a little bit biased towards him because he was such a thoroughly nice human being uh, and I think because I was able to kind of get closer to him than most managers because he needed all the friends he could get <laughs> it was a little bit more kind of insight into difficulties that he got um, you know couldn't couldn't really get a tune out of Enzobia really could he um, mm-hmm. you know I don't think he really thought his midfield was fit, fit for purpose back then so I think it was that I think I could uh, I could understand like I said, people people well within the rights to, to dislike him and, and what Villa became under him. But I think probably being able to be given a you know, given a little bit more of a peek behind the curtain with what, what kind of difficulties he, he faced gave me a bit more respect for him. And you know, he, he, I don't always shape these answers to plug podcasts, but obviously he's been been one of the guests and and spoke spoke very you know, obviously putting his own spin on the way the way that season went, but spoke very openly and honestly, and still mm-hmm. still seems to be kind of despite the the disappointment and the frustration of that job, seems to be a, a well adjusted human being. Which I think anybody who can leave managing Aston Villa and remain a well adjusted human being at the end of it is uh, somebody who, who, who commands more respect. So in the comments, there's a few interesting ones. Gareth says Heskey, which I can kind of see that. Um, I don't well, I didn't like him either. So yeah, clearly that's. <laughs> Proof of the concept. <laughs> uh, Rusty Ross says Stephen Ireland again, one I didn't like. So again, a good good choice. Carlos Hill is an option from Louis. Um, I quite like Carlos Hill, so maybe me and Louis are together on that one. I mean, he's okay. You wanted to like him, didn't you? That kind of player that's a bit bit tricky and stuff. Daniel Wales says Pepe Reina was he was he disliked? He was quite liked, wasn't he? Apart from the couple of mishaps, I think so. Yeah, I, don't, I mean it, it, it's. It's hard because if there's somebody who's a real kind of boo boy of the fans and everybody hates them, it's probably a reason. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A, I'm not going to come on here. So if you all of a sudden say, "Oh, you know Jeremy that goal in Let's Got was, um, <laughs> was was great," he was misunderstood and all that kind of thing, and you know, who who wouldn't tweet a picture of their car after a six nil defeat? <laughs> you know, you, you put yourself at odds with the whole of the fan base. So yeah. who, who's yours? My one that hasn't come up in the comments yet is Ashley Westwood. Because he got so much stick for, oh, he only goes sideways, he only goes backwards. And yes, there was an element of that, but that's because Villa was so poor at that time. Um, could he have been better? Could we have had a better standard of player? Yeah, probably. But for the, the hate that he got, I think he did an okay job for, I don't know how long he was there, a couple of seasons maybe, three years, something like that. I thought he was all right, but he just always got that, oh, he's boring, he always goes sideways, he always goes backward, he's too negative. But I quite liked him. I don't know why, because yeah, he wasn't he wasn't spectacular, he wasn't flashy, but he, did a decent job. I tend to dislike footballers more if they're just kind of unprofessional. It sounds a bit cliche, but just don't treat treat the badge and the privilege of playing for Aston Villa with the, you know, with the the recognition and the desire that it deserves. But people who are just average players, 
we can't really do anything about that, can you? Sometimes yeah. it's circumstance that you've been picked by the manager and it's nothing to do with, with the fans, yeah. really. Louis says that he's still doing well at Burnley as well. He's still playing in the Premier League regularly, same as Matty Loughton, another one that wasn't disliked to the same extent, but was got rid of from Villa because he wasn't deemed good enough. And then six, seven years later, he's, he's still playing Premier League football when Villa weren't as well at one period. So not as bad as people say, those two. This is kind of the same same ilk. I'm going to just let you have this one because I think there's probably one name in particular. Um, so the best player or talent who didn't meet your initial expectations? These three people who come to mind. Um, you can take this one then because I couldn't think of anybody. I think Stephen Ireland has just been mentioned. I thought yeah. when when Villa got him uh, as a make-weight in the James Milner deal as Milner went to Man City, I knew we were losing a really brilliant player in Milner, but I thought as a consolation prize, Stephen Ireland wasn't bad because I've seen Stephen Ireland during his Man City heyday just absolutely, you know, be, be brilliant, a real mm-hmm. live wire, you know, good range of passing, lively, mobile, um, you know, good close control. And, you know, I think those are during his kind of Man City Superman pants days. Um, mm-hmm. And he was, he was brilliant, but he came and it was just the hype well he didn't have a manager really he was signed when Villa didn't really have a manager so you know and I think his first real manager was Julio who didn't really take kindly to the you know pink wheel trims and shark tanks in his in his house and shoot the pipes um, so that one because I knew what he was capable. He, he was a good player who just didn't deliver at Villa yeah. Charlton Zobia was another who kind of single-handedly kept wigging up and then just came to Villa and just, you know, I can't even, what did he do at Villa? All I can remember him for is Shay Given taking a photo of him wearing a pair of curtains or something in the dressing room. <laughs> um, and further back, I wouldn't say he's a great player, but he was one who, who carried disappointment, was Graham Taylor signed Tony Cascarino to effectively win us the league. Um that didn't Back go well. Then. In the 90s. And I think he ousted Ian Olney, who Ian Olney was a bit of a kind of a workhorse who perhaps didn't get the, the recognition he deserved. And Cascarino was was poor, just you know, just didn't fit. Just he was supposed to be the final piece of the jigsaw, but just didn't fit. I wouldn't say he was the best player because Villa should have all you know, they should have signed Teddy Sheringham from Millwall anyway, rather than uh, rather than Tony Cascarino back then. Um, but th- those would be my three of ones that, that that kind of expected a lot more for and from and didn't live up to the hype. There's one that you haven't mentioned that I thought you would. It's been mentioned in the comments. I don't know whether this is just perceptions change over time and our expectations have gone through the floor in recent years or that our signings have got better. But all the names here are ones that are you know, early 2000s or late 90s. Collie Moore is the one I thought you would say. Uh, we've got Sasa Sertic, uh, Stefan Moore, Bosco Balaban, <laughs> Jemba Jemba. Uh, Milan Barros, Stan Collymore from Rick Barclay is the one I thought you'd go for. Lansbury and Hogan, maybe of more recent times, where you think oh, they'll come in. The other one I thought of, and this probably sounds extra stupid, was Ross McCormack. When we signed him, I was thinking, oh, he'll bang in goals in the Championship. He, yeah. He's done it He's done it at Leeds, he did it at Fulham. He'll come in, score loads of goals, we'll get promoted. Happy days. And obviously an absolute disaster. So one of recent years, era, I would go I would go McCormack, but... I thought Colin Moore was the obvious one that you go for there. So you know, me mate, like to keep you guessing. Um, I yeah. think it's an issue that several of those players will have had a habit during the um, during the nineties of signing players from relegated relegated teams like Churchich, who didn't didn't quite kick on and was brilliant at Bolton and then not quite the same at Villa. And I mean, Mark Draper is an interesting one for me because I don't think. I thought he was good for Villa, but I never thought that he lived up to what he was when he was at Leicester and Alan Thompson when they signed when we signed him from from Bolton. Um, but Lan- Lansbury, just you mentioning Lansbury now, Lansbury, <laughs> Hope, and McCormack. Before you go any further, the next one out was the worst worst ever signing that Villa have made. Now you can look at this two ways: are the worst ever in hindsight when you look back and go, "Oh, it's wasted money," or they didn't offer what they should have, or one at the time where you signed them and thought, well, "I don't know why we've gone for that. What was the point?" Are any of those the ones that names we've mentioned there? Are they worst signings ever, or is that just because we look back at it and go, "Oh, they didn't work out"? Because McCormack at the time, see, obviously we spent a lot of money on him, but it seemed like it could have worked out. Henry Lansby the same; he looked good for Forest, so he should come in and do good for Villa. It just didn't work out. So at the time, you wouldn't say worst signing. Even Julian Lescott, to a certain extent, I think he was Albion's Player of the Year before the year before he came to Villa. He thought, "Oh, yeah, it was a bit of experience. It's a free transfer. That's actually not that bad." With hindsight, they are terrible signings. So it depends on how you want to assess it. It's difficult for how you quantify what's the worst sign. Is it the one who's been the biggest waste of money because you've spent a fortune on their fee and on their wages? Um, 
this is I'm being being really really harsh on the lad now, but I think this is because of the hype, and we, we've spoken about this fella before. I always think of Simon Dawkins just because that just because that one tweet, just yeah. that big build up, the lights still on, just as if it's going to be oh wow, this is a big one. It must be a big sign if they've left the lights on. They normally sign the crap ones in the dark. Um, <laughs> but just just him and he, it was a, it was a shot to nothing. It didn't really cost a great deal. He was on he was on loan. You know, it was a Lambert was kind of fishing in that market where he thought I've not got a great deal to spend. Let's try. Um, I don't think he's the worst signing. He's just the one that just the one that that I always remember. Do you want to see comment name for worst signing? Yeah, what we got. So we've got Danny Drinkwater twice with laughing emojis. We've got Borgia Baston <laughs> from two people as well. And um, we've got Tony Cascarino from Michael. Um, Michael Richards says Steve and Phil says that he expected more from Michael Richards, which yeah, is fair. But again, at the time, you look at that and think, oh, free transfer, still got something he's played for England, should do a job. So at the time, I wouldn't say worth signing. And you've got names like Tonev, Michael Bradley, Ender Stevens. Grant Holt, Grant Holt's a good one because I remember at the time thinking, "Christ, that's not a good sign." And that is, that's awful. That is, he was was he playing for Wigan in the Championship, or did he go to Wigan afterwards? I don't know. He was terrible somewhere before we signed. It was like, what is even the point of Grant Holt? Hellenius? Oh God, we've had some terrible players, haven't we? <laughs> are the worst? Are the worst ones the ones that you know at the time? I, I think that is worse because you think, or well, as a fan, you're looking at it going, I don't know why we've done that. So surely as football professionals and people who are scouting experts, what have they seen to make you spend X amount on them? I don't think there's ever been a sign you've looked at and gone, Christ, that's bad. And then they've turned out good. They always turn out as as you expect, don't they, I think? Yeah, I mean, listen, uh, probably feeds into what your man was saying earlier about Heskey. I don't think Heskey would come anywhere near the worst signing for Aston Villa. But neither I think neither did I ever think Heskey was going to be the missing piece of the jigsaw when mine yeah. had it. Have we not done a podcast about what what was the one where where yeah, we did the the player, was that was that it? yeah, we did the worst Villa player ever in a World Cup knockout. I think it was Les Scott versus McCormack in the final, if I remember right. Oh, here we go. So these are two football related ones to end with our actual modern day football. Um will the pandemic halt Aston Villa's progress? Or does I'm sort of split this into two sections? Or does having wealthy owners mean we don't need to worry about it? Now, I've kind of split that into two because I think, will the pandemic halt our progress in terms of right now with the coronavirus and Villa players suffering? That has potential to impact this season specifically. The second part of having wealthy owners, obviously we don't know what the financial situation is going to look like after this is all cleared up. But I don't think that does matter because they've got billions and billions of pounds and they can do whatever they want. Yeah, unless Villa, unless we thought Villa, and we still might, have a realistic chance of cracking the top four this season. And the pandemic makes that all kind of fall away because well, the season's cancelled or something like that. The season's cancelled, or Villa have such a backlog of games that they pick up injuries and suspensions and fatigue and all that. That I think Villa, as a project, can carry whatever happens this season and still think that they're going to go forward from here in mm. in positive shape. You know, it's not as if you know they've signed players who are at the winter of their careers on big money. Who, if we don't get the value out of them this season, we're going to be. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, not, we're not going to get value out of them. Um, I think it's unfortunate because, and listen, we're only talking about Villa missing a week and a half so far. So, you know, I know that there's the Newcastle game and the Manchester City games have already had to be kind of added added to the fixture list. But I think last season, we've spoken about this at length, haven't we? That that Villa benefited from that kind of the season being halted and it was it allowed it allowed Villa to, you know, to reset and, and, and to take stock of where they were and to make improvements. Flip side of that this year is we didn't need that we didn't need that break because we got positive momentum and everything was was going no. going fairly fairly swimmingly. Um, but I, don't, I think I think Villa, you know, don't attempt fire, but Villa seem to be a well a well run enough club, you know, in most aspects of, of the football club at the moment that just deal with deal with what what's what's thrown yeah. them really. So I don't think I don't think I don't think the pandemic can hit Villa any worse than it will any other football club really. And I think Villa are in a better place because they're they're better managed than a lot of football clubs at the moment. So does that answer the question? Or? It does, yeah. And I'm happy to move on to the last question in the random mug of Destiny. Man City, Newcastle, Burnley, Southampton, West Ham. Five games, 13 days. How many points? Well, we owe West Ham. I'll work backwards. We owe West Ham one, don't we? Um, We owe Southampton one. 
Um, we have Burnley one for not being able to break them down. Oh, we have this is the, for the cup final. This is the squad in it five games in thirteen days. God, if that if if Jurgen Klopp faced that that kind of fixture oh, schedule, he it, his head would explode, wouldn't it? Um, tears. Fifteen points available. I'll, I'll, give you, all right, I'll give you two answers here. One that you would be like a point starter that you'd accept, one that you'd be happy with, and one that you think Villa could actually realistically get. Whether they're the same or not is a different matter. They probably are the same, aren't they? You'd probably think 15 points on offer, you'd, you'd probably want nine of them, wouldn't you? That's exactly what um, I said earlier on Twitter. There's not too many draws in there. Villa haven't, haven't produced many yeah. draws, have they, so far this season? Um, so, yeah. I'd be not, happy with nine. I think you could you can beat Newcastle, Burnley, and one of Southampton or West Ham, and then the other two, Man City, Southampton, or West Ham. There's a chance you could still beat one or even both of those, or definitely pick up draws. And I know it isn't as easy as just going, oh, well, these are the games where you pick up the points because it's it's unpredictable. But I'd take nine from those those fixtures generally. Those fixtures coming up in 13 days, nine points out of such a small space of time with a squad that isn't deep. I think that'd be a good turnaround. But having said that, I'd, I'd be happy with nine. I think twelve is a realistic aim as well. I think you could win four or five there. Yeah, in theory, it just depends on how badly COVID has affected the Villa squad and the staff, the preparations, and obviously how uh, how difficult that is to be literally playing rest, playing rest for thirteen days in a row. Yeah, I think nine points keeps you competitive and it leaves you in the pack, doesn't it? Ahead yeah. of the. The final straight. I know we're a few months away from the, the home straight of the season yet, but I think it's yeah, I, us. <laughs> well, yeah, I'd, I'd I'd be I'd be satisfied with with nine points. Well, it depends what what we want Villa to be. Obviously, we want Villa to be the best they can possibly be. We want them to finish in the top four. We want them to challenge for the title. But you know, I still think if, if Villa finish, I think I started the season saying if Villa finish sixteenth, seventh, fifteenth, that's progress. I'd be gutted if Villa didn't finish in the top half of the table. No, yeah, um, so do I. I've got mixed mixed feelings about what good European football would do for Villa next season. If we're back, if we're allowed back in the stadiums, yes, let's have it. Let's bring it on. If it's European football behind closed doors, then I don't know what what impact that has on Villa's squad and what Villa need to do in the summer to make sure that we are upgrading the Keenan Davis and the the Conor Conor Harahan quickly. Um, you know, that feels like a good problem to have. That feels a bit like the argument of going, oh, is it? Does it make sense to get promoted this year, or should we recoup and go next year? To me, if it comes earlier than I anticipated, that's a, that's that's the beneficial option anyway because Villa will oh, just yeah. have to adapt with it. Yeah, finish as hard as you can, and then like I said, Villa are well run clubs. So deal with deal with the, the consequences of that that then, um, but. I think just Villa just need to, for me, if Villa can get, say we, we take take games in, in four game blocks. I know you've taken five games there, so 12 game blocks. If Villa can get to a place where they get, get in six, seven, eight points out of those four game blocks, I think that 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 sees that that they that we do this season justice and we we finish yeah. you know we we take a, a massive leap of progress rather than the kind of little kind of baby steps of progress that we thought we we're going to make. Um, so, I, you know, how many games have Villa played and how many have we how many have we got left? We've played fifteen, so we've got what's that twenty three left to go. We're not even at the half. Well, obviously, no one's at the halfway point yet, but some are closer than others. Man United, you know, for example, have played seventeen. Um, we've played 15, 26 yeah. points we've got at the moment. We're, we've got more points now than we did when we went into lockdown last year. <laughs> We're only, what, seven or eight points away from our total last year. Like it's, uh, Phil's just said it's great that we're not even talking about trying to stay up. That isn't even the conversation anymore. That's not the, oh, well, 17th would be good enough. 16th would be progress. 15th would be amazing is what we're all thinking at one point last year. Um, I think I said the same on a, a similar podcast. There was a time last year when people were thinking, well, if we're top six, top four in the championship at the start of 2021, that's probably a good position to be in, c- considering that at one point we all thought we were going down. The fact that we're still eighth in the Premier League come January 2021, and I know we're a little bit behind schedule where you'd usually be in January of, of the season, but even so, we've got games in hand, we look good. As long as COVID hasn't hit our first team players too badly in terms of the long-term effects of it, and it's one nice bonus, obviously we don't know who's had it apart from Trezor Guy, as far as I know. Jack Grealish has been running on Instagram in his little home gym and doing stuff, so he's not still bed-bound, for example. Um, so if the players that are, you know, that are starting games and doing well for Villa aren't too effective by by this um, outbreak and they come back and they start winning games again and we start picking up points as much as that's not what is it 
uh, five games in 13 days, if Villa are playing well and they get some momentum in, they'll want to play every game. The adrenaline will carry them through some of those, those minutes as well. And if we keep winning, it might be a good thing that we're playing so regularly. So it depends which way it goes. It either is a, it's a positive and we look good and everything's okay. Or we come back, get beat by Man City, Newcastle and Burnley and think, oh Christ, this is it. Here we go. See, season's derailed a little bit. We've just got to wait until... We'll just throw this open to the comments and I'll be rounding up in a minute. Do you think Villa can hit 60 points this season? Yeah. Looking at the table last season, 60 points would have got you sixth place. Really? Um, that, that seems quite low to me. I don't know whether my figure's just, uh, just off because I'm not used to looking at the top six of a Premier League table for so long, but 60 to get the top six. Yeah. Oh. So I don't know what I don't know what the kind of rate is this season of how teams are accumulating points, but looking at the table now and Villa's games, and albeit a massively busy busy fixture list, sixty points seems doable. Um, well, yeah, we're not even at halfway, and we're not at thirty points yet. So if on nineteen yeah. games we're on thirty points, in theory you can do the same again and get sixty. And in, uh, you could argue that in that first. 15 games we should be on more than 26 anyway that that next five game period when we come back is where we'll define our season I think if we get nine points plus you look at Villa and go they're on track to do something serious here if it all falls apart after that five game period then still a good season and we'll still you know we've no fear of going down but like you said, I'd be very disappointed not to end up in that top 10 at the end of the season. Thank you, everyone, for watching our little Q&A session. Obviously, we've done one of these because there's no games to talk about, as people haven't noticed. Games are being cancelled left, right and centre, and we had to do something. It's been fun, actually. I like doing the little random mug question thing that we used to do. Um, and thanks for everyone who sent questions to me on, on Twitter. You can follow me at Dan Rowlandson. You're at Matt Kendrick, aren't you, I think? Yeah, one T. Uh, one T, like a loser. You can also follow us on at Clara Blue Pod. Um, so thank you very much for sending your stuff over. Thanks to everyone who watched live on Facebook as well, getting involved and, and answering the questions we're answering as well. That's been uh, nice to see the differences in opinion. So thank you very much for that. Um, and thanks to those that are watching this, not live after the fact. Again, get involved in comment sections, iTunes reviews, etc., etc. Thank you very much. We'll see you again next week at some point, hopefully to talk about the Man City game. I assume it's going ahead on Wednesday. I think it's is that move that forward to six o'clock now instead of eight o'clock. I think so, mate. The the podcasts are going to be coming thick and fast, aren't they? During that that fixture schedule, so we're just going to have to make sure our routines are are all kept in check as well, mate. So drink plenty of water. Yeah. Um, well, I always look at that when everyone's going. Everyone's going. Oh, five games, thirteen days. I'm going five podcasts, thirteen days. Yeah. That's a lot. That's a You're going to have to do some proper training, mate. You know, learn learn some of those simple words that you tend to stumble over and that. Put yeah. a bit of extra practice in. Um, I'll do my, so. my best, mate. Um, but yeah, we'll be back soon with something. If it, there's no game, we'll think of something else. Thank you very much for tuning in. We appreciate it. We'll see you soon. Up the villa. Thank you for listening to Claret and Blue, an Aston Villa podcast. If you enjoyed today's episode, then please let us know. We love hearing your feedback. We'll be back soon with another episode. Until then, up the villa. Up the villa.